Hello, and welcome to Hopkins at Home. Thank you for joining us. I'm David Peters, a professor and chair of the Department of International Health at the Bloomberg School, and I'm director for the Alliance for a Healthier World. The Alliance is a university-wide initiative focused on health equity, and particularly around addressing complex problems of health equity that require collaborative and multidisciplinary approaches. Today, we're gonna to be talking about COVID-19 and how issues of inequity, trust and mistrust around health information affect vulnerable and marginalized communities. We welcome you to ask questions you have by typing them into the chat module on your screen throughout any time throughout the talk, and we'll leave some time at the end of the talk to answer them. Now let's jump right in. Today, we have two guests, Darrell Brooks and Daniela Rodriguez. Now you can read more about their bios on the website, but let me first introduce Darrell Brooks. Darrell is an interdisciplinary research scholar practitioner and a social justice educator from Baltimore. He is founder and CEO of Love and Justice Consulting, LLC, an organization that provides leaders with diversity and social justice learning opportunities. He's also a research associate in the Department of Epidemiology in the Bloomberg School of Public Health. His project, on medical mistrust and misinformation of COVID-19 among low-income African-Americans with comorbid risk factors is one of the 24 COVID and health equity projects that were funded by the Alliance for a Healthier World and with the support of the university president and provost office. Darrell, can you tell us a little bit about the background of your projects, maybe about the context and what inspired you to do this work? Thank you so much. It's really great to be here. Um, really, the when I think about sort of what really got me interested in uh, doing this particular project was really about partly my history being in Baltimore. So I'm from Baltimore. I'm a native, also aware of like the long historical um, challenges that African Americans, particularly low African Americans, face in Baltimore City. And I so I think a part of my interest in this project was one to figure out like how do we begin to give back. Um, how do I begin to show up in my community doing something that matters during a particular time when um, high levels of misinformation um, and disinformation um, were uh, swirling in uh, communities through social media networks um, and other uh, digital pathways. And so um, my interest was really about not only to participate, but then to create a process for then thinking about how do we, how does misinformation and disinformation relate to the his long historical legacy of medical mistrust, even here in this Baltimore city, even when I think about the, the role of um, our particular university um, that has played a part of that, um, in addition to all of the many layers of poverty and all systemic, systemic inequalities have just layered on to produce um, disparate and, uh, and unequal access to care um, and also quality to quick care for African-Americans and particularly low African-Americans in the city. Um, and so I really wanted to think about a way to help challenge and push back against um, misinformation and disinformation because at the end of the day, um, this is my community, I'm a part of it. Um, and I wanna make sure that my family and my friends and all of the other low um, African-Americans and low income African-Americans specifically have access um, and don't allow this information to have them engaging in practices that might put them at greater risk for uh, uh, acquiring COVID-19. So I think for me, that's kind of my, my big um, yeah. inspiration to do this work. That was very cool, very compelling as well. Let me also introduce the other, our other guest, Daniela Rodriguez. Daniela is a health systems researcher and practitioner who largely works in low and middle income countries, and that's where I know her best. So I'm going to hear a little bit more about what's the work you're doing in Baltimore. Much of Daniela's work addresses issues around the intersection of politics and public health, such as how do you use evidence, how are policies implemented, and how, how policy issues affect vulnerable populations in urban and peri-urban environments. Daniela is an associate scientist in the Department of International Health in the Bloomberg School of Public Health. 
And her team also won a grant through the Alliance for a Healthier World called Rapid Baltimore, a mobile application for rapid access to infectious disease information in Baltimore. So you can always already hear some of the uh, some of the overlap or, con- or similarities. Anyway, Danielle, can you tell us a little bit more about your project, why you're doing it, and what you're trying to accomplish? Yes, absolutely. Um, and thank you so much, David. And it's great to see you, Darrell. And thank you to Hopkins at Home for having us. So to give you a little bit of context about what prompted us to do this study, um, overall, the Latinx community in Maryland and in many other parts of the country have been disproportionately affected by COVID. So in Maryland, uh, Latinx uh, folks are about 10% of the population, but over they're about a quarter of the COVID cases in the state. And we saw as particular early on that the positivity rate among folks that were getting tested was really high, up to 40% was assessed by folks at Hopkins. And it's not entirely surprising. These are folks that are on the front line. They're essential workers. They live in crowded, they have crowded living conditions, but also because so many of uh, the Latinx community in particular in Baltimore city are immigrants of sort of um, uh, unstable documentation status. They also have limited access to care and other social services, both that the predated COVID And those things all got much worse. And it also meant that there is a limited social safety net as it related to workplace protections, um, access to food and and things like that. And so what we saw was a number of non-governmental organizations really trying to step into this breach to be able to increase access to testing, access to care, food, um, school supports and, and so on. And trying to sort of um, to, to fill those gaps that the system was not um, in place to fill beforehand. The other thing that's sort of going on in you know sort of historically and in particular in the last few years is the um, political rhetoric in particular coming from the federal level around um, uh, immigrants in our communities. And I don't know how familiar you are, but there's a there's a policy known as the public charge, which is one that suggests that if you um, access any kind of services from the government, even if you are entitled to them, you could jeopardize your path um, to residency and citizenship. So that already created a condition through which folks in these communities really didn't want to access services if they could avoid it. One of the organizations um, that uh, was one of the ones that stepped into this breach is one that we're partnering with on the study and we're doing this together. In fact, the co-PI is the the, um, executive director and it's called Centro Sol, which is the Center for Health and Opportunities for Latinos in Baltimore. And one of the one of the many activities that they've been doing and that they started early on was to create a blog of resources in Spanish around COVID, symptoms, where to get treatment, how to get, you know, what's happening with schools, all that kind of stuff. And it was being trying to kind of, you know, information was constantly coming through. But one of the biggest issues is that all the information comes out in English. um, And then you have to wait until it becomes available in Spanish or translate it yourself. Um, And one of the, what Centro Soto was trying to do was trying to aggregate what was available in one place. But it's not easily searchable, it's not interactive, it's not necessarily easy to find. So what we're doing with this project is creating a mobile application um, that takes all of that information and makes it more interactive, more easily accessible, but specifically creates a platform that is targeted towards the needs of low income communities. So it doesn't have a ton of graphics. It doesn't have a ton of pictures and videos. So if you go to it, you might say to yourself, this is boring. I don't want to interact with this. Um, But one of the things we're trying to do is recognize that the needs of folks in our community are such that they have old phones, uh, limited data plans, that kind of stuff. We want it to be um, that can meet them where they are and that centralizes things in their own in their own language. And, and we focused um, primarily with Latino immigrants, partly because of the partnership with Centro Sol, but because they also form the largest group of immigrants in Baltimore City. Um, so, uh, you know, Baltimore City has about 8% of its population is immigrants and the largest group is from um, Latin America and the Caribbean. So that's, well, that's how we got started. That, that's interesting. I, I have to, to ask though, you know, the same kind of issues that, uh, create um, not only disadvantage, but barriers of access to care, barriers of access to information must make it difficult for you to get to actually study in this community. And yes, you've got a partner that's that's already providing services, but uh, how, how are you able to collect data at this stage, particularly during this time <laughs> of distancing and when you have this level of distress? So we did two approaches. We piloted the app through two different approaches. One was we tried to do a user survey. Um, well, no, we did a user survey, which was all entirely online. And so we used, we leveraged Centro Sol's food, food distribution network 
to send invitations and an incentive to get people to participate. But what we ended up finding <clears throat> is that people then, we gave them a number they could call if they had questions. Lots of people then call and said, I'm not sure how this works. Are, are you legitimate? Um, is this for real? Uh, that kind of thing. And so there was a lot of, um, a, a lot of sort of handholding that had to go with that. With the interview portion where we were asking, trying to understand better where people get information and how do we improve trust in a service like this, um, we had to tap into our own networks and then other networks to try to get further outside our own ring of people that we know so that we make sure that we're not start just serving the, the folks that live in Southeast Baltimore where there's a big congregation, but in other places as well. That took some time. And then the hardest thing was, again, getting people to answer our messages, um, we find, find the time to talk to them. And actually for some of them, teach them how to use Zoom because we couldn't meet them in person and um, you know get them to figure out sort of the interface and, and, and all of that, and then sort of help them navigate the site itself. So not the easiest study I've ever done, I will say, um, but, uh, but manageable all things considered. And I think that to some extent being forced to do the data collection online also forced us to think more about how to make the site itself more user-friendly. That's very cool. Darrell, maybe you could tell us a bit also about the aims of your project and what you're trying to, trying to do. Absolutely. So the first aim that we um, sort of are targeting for this piece was around analyzing social media misinformation and disinformation. So um, really thinking about sort of what was floating in the, in the, the blogosphere um, around COVID-19. Um, and then sort of, um, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but then our aims too was around really trying to do some uh, myths and perceptions, uh, really trying to get at both medical mistrust and sort of some of the historical context there, but then also to try to get at some of the um, uh, COVID-19 information and beliefs and perceptions uh, for folks who either have pre-existing conditions um, and for, for those who did not, to see if there were any differences between um, how they were understanding the information mm -hmm. and how it was impacting um, their experience. Um, and sort of for me, which is uh, one of the most critical pieces um, is really this last thing, which is taking all of the things that we know and trying to develop a culturally specific um, so social media literacy tool for to help folks understand and to read and to analyze information so that they become more aware and to be and more discerning around what is good quality and solid information, particularly scientific information, um, as well as also what I didn't uh, say is um, how do we begin to actually build trust? Because there's a lot of work that looks yeah. at and analyzes mistrust and distrust, but not sort of what do we need to do to actually build trust in this particular community? And so a part of the upcoming um, in-depth qualitative interviews will be to really um, focus in on that. Um, and to go back to that aim one, so I talked about the, the social media. So um, some of the things that we saw um, in some of the initial uh, preliminary findings was, you know, this whole blogosphere around, um, uh, like home remedy solutions to COVID-19, right? And so that was um, using things like um, sink um, and um, uh, um, um, lemon juice. So like things that you would try to normally treat sort of like flu-like symptoms or call a common cold that folks were, you know, kind of positioning those as additional ways to sort of combat um, COVID-19. Um, but also what was interesting about that was that there were also things that were a little bit more medical. And when you start to pay attention to it, uh, th there were things like um, uh, doctors um, who, m some are actually certified doctors, um, um, but just have a very different philosophy. We're going online and talking about that sort of um, wearing masks, what calls hypoxia, uh, which is sort of um, uh, the, when your body doesn't have access to enough oxygen because you're wearing protect protective coverings. Um, and then also um, what's particularly unique is that some of these things, you know, started off in right um, conspiracy, like right wing, more um, conservative white areas and sort of white networks, um, and then translated um, and sort of moved over into um, sort of the African-American community. Um, and so a lot of that sort of, some of the origin story had been around, um, if anyone, uh, as Daniela was talking about the social political context, um, Diamond and Silk, who were pretty much surrogates, African-American surrogates for Trump. Mm -hmm. um, and so they went out and they started spewing misinformation and disinformation and conspiracy theories. And so some of this is being attached to sort of taking those, um, th that information from these 
uh, conservative online um, blog spaces and then sort of trying to um, have them replicated by using surrogates and other black people to then spread that message. Uh, and so that was one of the dynamics that we started to see when we started to dig in there. And I can talk more about it, but I just uh, want to be mindful of time as well. Oh, that's that's really interesting. Well, but let, let me ask him this question, uh, continuing on the question of trust and ask about the question of trust with you as researchers. Now, Terrell, you're from the community, as you said, you're from Baltimore. Does that lead special issues for you? Maybe groups that are that you don't necessarily recognize or are left out, or how do you how do you overcome or how do you identify even those issues of trust when you're from the area? Well, well you know, I think I I might get a little bit of additional credibility, but it, it's not much. It's not. <laughs> It's, it's, you know, um, you know, I can drop sort of where I grew up and all of these things. Uh, but what is really what I've noticed is that um, a part of me being from the community is that I actually still actively participate in it. And so this research project is not the first thing that I've done. I still work at a, um, I volunteer at a nonprofit that works with African American LGBT folks. So like my name and my presence is already in the community. So it's not actually, so I'm not new. So I'm not just the outside researcher who right. is coming in to do a project. Um, and so what that has afforded me is that I already have relationships with community partners from different sectors. I already go out when we could go out um, to participate in um, events. So if anything, I think it's my act of participation in the community in which I live that really gives me the, um, uh, an, an advantage um, here, but it does not also come with the recognition that I work at an entity that um, some people fear to still go to. Um, and so I still have to work through the, the myths and the beliefs and the things that we're carrying. Um, there's still, a, interestingly enough, a pervasive belief that if you go to Hopkins, um, they, that's what they really do. They only want to do research on you and then you will go and you will disappear. And so like that is something that is, I still hear constantly. Um, and uh, one thing that I've known about information like this, it, it's generational and that's how it's transmitted. So I get to, my grandmother was alive when Tuskegee was happening, right? So mm -hmm. it is not, um, uh, irrational um, sort of a belief that, that, that things were um, happening specifically towards African-Americans. So she carried that belief. And then that was also transmitted um, to my mom and to me. And so, um, and they're all still alive. So, we, so we're still, uh, the information and sort of how people were treated back in um, those times and even up until contemporary times still matter, uh, particularly when word of mouth um, is still critically important um, for, for building um, trust in, in communities, particularly the African-American community in Baltimore. Um, so I think at the end of the day, working through those cultural dimensions, it helps that I know some of the things that typically come up so that I can at least um, sort of challenge and sort of um, try to correct, and if nothing else, build a strong enough relationship with folks and different community organizations so that they know if nothing else, um, that I actually have their best interests at heart because I'm an active participant in this community and I'm not I'm not going anywhere. You know, right. I live here, I work here, I play here. That's kind of, um, I think, what's helpful um, at this moment. Oh, those are great reminders. You know, as researcher, as community member, also this, you know, this intergenerational legacy of, of relationships uh, between research and community is, is important. And, uh, you know, and all the cultural attachments that go along with that. Now, Daniela, you told us about your community that you're working in are many, many of them are immigrants. So their mm -hmm. you know, generations wouldn't be based in Baltimore. But how, how are you seeing those issues of um, mistrust between researchers and, and the communities that you're working in? So unlike uh, Darrell, I didn't grow up here. I mean, I didn't grow up, not just not in Baltimore, I didn't grow up in this country. So I'm, I also um, immigrated to the United States, but I have a very different immigration story than you know the majority of the immigrant community in the city. Um, and I look very different, right? I, you know, I'm a white woman, um, you know, a white Latina, but white all the same. And so my immigration experience is very different. And I have to sort of I have to recognize that going in because I need to be able to come to these conversations with a with a lot of empathy right up front, right? Um, so the other part of this is that, th as uh, David mentioned in the beginning, this is not typically where I work. I typically work in um, in other countries. And so it has been a bit of a pivot in the last couple of years in partnership with Centro Sol for other different types of activities to get to know more what's going on in the community here. And I think that 
our study would not be possible in any way, shape or form without the partnership of Centro Sol because Monica, our co-PI um, and the other uh, founding directors of the center have spent a lot of time establishing Centro Sol as a key resource in the community, as an important partner and network um, that's very deeply embedded. And, and we've seen that play out, not just in terms of getting people to talk to us or, or even having sort of like our first list of respondents just by the networks that they maintain, but when we've also talked to folks um, about you know what would help increase the trust in our resource that we're developing. How do we make it so that you can, at first glance, think to yourself, this is this is a source of information that I can trust. Um, and one of the sort of thing, one of the things that comes up a lot is, can you affiliate it with Centro Sol? Can you use their logo or something like that? Because that is an image that people recognize, regardless of whether they can read and write in Spanish and English, no matter what it is, they'll recognize that logo and say, okay, this is a resource that I can trust. The other thing that's been um, really, I, I think the other thing that's worth pointing out is that what has come up or become more evident, I guess, during the COVID response um, and came up in our studies is that there are a few other partners in the community that are making a really big difference. So there is a, a sort of a news media channel, I don't know how else to describe it, that's strictly on social media, it's on Facebook, and it is an extremely trusted resource um, for information. And so making sure that those folks have accurate information about COVID is a really important conduit to getting information to the community at large. And the other resource is the uh, Mayor's Office on Immigrant and Multicultural Affairs. The fact that the city has an office like that that was working already on these issues that was um, funded to be focusing on the, was a, is a huge difference. They're the ones that have highlighted 12 different languages. Um, and so, you know, uh, making sure that, that partners like that are, um, are represented in the, in the work that we do. I will say that um, when we asked folks about, again, about the sort of trust issue, how do you make this a resource that you can trust more? And we we're saying, you know, there's different things that we could do. How do we, how do we share it so that you know about it? If you um, got to a point where you trusted it enough, would you give us your phone number so we could send you like an alert, right? Um, and people were saying, why would you need my phone number? Um, who are you giving it to? If I get a request from these kinds of people then I might do it, I share things within my own neighborhood, you know, stuff that's coming from outside those, that very, very tight knit circle of sort of your immigrant friends and family isn't going to have very deep penetration. And I think that says something you were, um, you know, Darrell, we were talking a little bit offline before this about um, sort of the integration of immigrant communities in different parts of the city. Um, and I think that, you know, that's something that I think would be interesting to explore because the typical pattern of how folks move to cities is that they go and they, for immigrant, they create these immigrant enclaves that are kind of, you know, they're protective, right? They're, they're a resource and their protection um, to make sure that folks can be, um, can uh, help each other out, but also make sure that they're not put in jeopardy, which is obviously their biggest concern all the time. Great. I was wondering, you, you know, you've started talking about some of the, the learnings from your project. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about uh, what you've learned so far and has, has anything surprised you? Daniela, maybe tell us a bit about uh, things, about hmm. some early results you can share. Um, I mean, is, is it immodest to say that none of it has surprised us? It's just nice to have data behind it. Um, because one of the things that we have heard and we thought this going in was, you know, the, these folks in these communities, they want to be informed, they want to know what's going on, and they want to have accurate information, and it is not available in a language they can understand. And it's not available quickly. And so they want that. Right. They don't want to be, you know, they don't want to be sort of behind the curve in terms of what are the best practices and things like that. But the information is not necessarily available. And, you know, I, there has been a, a steep curve in making sure that resources are available for folks, not just basic information, which is what in a lot of ways we're offering. Um, but something as simple as how do you facilitate the process for te getting tested? How do you uh, there, the city has established an isolation center that you can go to free of charge if you test positive and can't, don't want to stay at home, you know, if you live in a crowded space. It takes enormous amounts of work and trust to convince people to be able to go to a place like that and convince them that, you know, ICE isn't going to show up and raid the place. Um, and I'm not going to mention them by name, but there is a phone, widely available phone resource that for the first few months of the pandemic only had one Spanish speaking operator on staff 
not per shift, on staff. Um, that's, that's a humongous gap. And that's not even speaking to the needs of other immigrant communities in the city that speak other languages like Korean or Mandarin or, or, or stuff like that. So, you know, these are things that we knew were going on or we suspected were going on. So to hear community members say to us, we want this information, we want it in languages we can understand and we'll share it. We will make sure it gets around. You know, we just need to have it in hand. And so let, let me f follow up with, with a question from the audience related to things you've learned. And, and it's about the question about how do you increase trust? This comes from Hans and talking about vaccine hesitancy being a big issue now in COVID. Uh, how do we increase trust in the populations that you're working with, uh, with the upcoming COVID vaccine? Maybe Terrell, do you want to go first? Absolutely. I, you know, I think this is going to be um, uh, an incredibly important time to uh, think deeply uh, and meaningfully about trust. And um, what Daniela was talking about, and particularly around the credentialing of Central Seoul, um, was that like institution, that, that there is a thing called institutional trust, right? That because you provide such good quality care and services to me or to my community members, um, that I can refer you to them, that that is going to be the thing I think importantly and most importantly, gonna be the thing that helps shift this conversation uh, and to help people move from hesitancy to a place of acceptance of the vaccine. Um, I think uh, additionally, pathways to partnerships. I think sometimes we sort of wait to very last minute to think about building partnerships, particularly community uh, level partnerships as um, uh, secondary. But in this case, they are primary. Um, and so we need to be building uh, in community partnerships with trusted sources. And I think a part of my research is also about trying to figure out who are those trusted sources? And then how do we begin to leverage them, not only for this vaccine, because there will be things that come up over time where we, if we're in deep partnership um, and in deep collaboration, like we, I would ideally love to be having more uh, conversations about just um, scientific literacy um, from here on into infinity. Like it's, because I think there's always gonna be another wave of people um, in communities uh, that will always be hesitant, especially when you have legacies looming um, in our communities that say, um, I know this thing happened. I know that forced sterilization happened. I know that um, uh, testing and experimentation happened. Like, uh, and this isn't like necessarily like uh, that far away. Like, so if the government can do this, why, why all of a sudden is it, is it, it wild for me to think that, that it could happen again? Mm -hmm. And so I think this ongoing partnership becomes really critically important because you're gonna always constantly be refuting um, and helping to push back that misinformation or disinformation. Um, and so I would say that those will probably be two of the most important things that we can do right now to ensure that, um, to move folks from hesitancy to acceptance. And that, that sounds like a direct lesson for Hopkins in terms of what we do. But now there's a question, if I could follow up, there's a question from the audience also from, from Herbert about uh, the, the collaborators that you have. Now, have you tried reaching out or are you reaching out to African-American churches? Uh, or tell us maybe a bit more about the collaborators that you have in the community and in, in your research collaborators. Absolutely. So I think um, currently... Uh, my, mo my, my main entry point are organizations who I've been partly, partly working with um, from my work in the community um, organization, um, which is um, Black Equity Baltimore, which we do our, a lot of our LGBT work. So again, a lot of connections that I have, again, are we're working with Chase Brexton, we'll be working with um, um, Star Trek, we're gonna be working with um, the GLC, well, the, the, the Maryland Pride Center um, and other entities um, in terms of just the community-based response. Um, but there are also, like uh, folks mentioned, um, uh, churches and uh, congregations um, across the city who I would love to partner with. Um, it's just that we have to get to that part. I just know the, the first wave of, of, of folks will most likely be those, uh, those community partners where I know um, a part of my interest and in I will be also paying attention to uh, the ways in which um, LGBT folks, um, particularly when we think about medical mistrust and hesitancy also gets in there. So I wanna make sure that we have um, uh, that in there so I can also be having some conversations about what that might mean, um, especially when I think about the intersections of uh, folks who might be identifying as trans and I think about institutional trust, like all of those things begin to matter and accumulate over time um, mm -hmm. to, to sort of force people out um, and, and, and not feel safe and supported within their institutions. And so I think for me, I'm looking for a, a broad range of uh, partners, um, working with uh, uh, community members, 
Um, and I think, uh, at least for this particular portion of the study, um, uh, really thinking deeply and, and listening to the interviews around who folks trust and then trying to use that data to then intentionally go build strategic relationships based on the findings of, of those qualitative interviews. That's cool. Maybe just also, can you tell us about your collaborators from Hopkins? Ah, yes. Um, so here um, we're working with, um, our, I have a wonderful um, support um, with the uh, School of Nursing um, and um, the School of Medicine. Um, and um, that's um, Dr. Shea Harris and, and Dr. Joya Arscott. Um, and so both of them bring, um, Joyelle, Dr. Arscott brings, um, again, community-based uh, experience, um, being a nurse uh, and having served directly um, these particular populations. And specifically also um, Shea, um, uh, Dr. Uh, Harris, who uh, is actively seeing COVID-19 patients. Um, and so treating them. And so bringing this very rich um, sort of uh, experience in knowing about what does it mean to try to get people to um, to be healthy and to be thinking about themselves and their families. Um, and so I think for us, uh, we have a really great um, team and a uh, team of collaborators to really uh, try to come at this from many different angles. Um, and I think the most important piece is the care uh, that we have for um, uh, the communities. And of course, all the support from the Alliance for a Healthy World. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. No, thanks for not forgetting that. <laughs> Daniela, you, you told us a lot about the really central role of Central Soul. Uh, can mm -hmm. you tell us a bit more about your collaborators, both outside Hopkins and, and inside Hopkins? Mm -hmm. So inside Hopkins, it is, so we have a couple of folks um, that function in an advisory role from the School of Medicine and the School of Public Health. Um, but I would say that the most critical partner we have is a team from the Whiting School of Engineering led by Taki Gusa, um, who have been building this thing because I certainly have no technological capacity to build this thing. Um, and so their team has been fantastic and absolutely fundamental in getting us off the ground. And um, they have, they have, they, they come this sort of, they have this wealth of, of, of experience of doing um, uh, tech solutions like this from other settings and in other health topics. And so, you know, brought their know-how to this. Um, and because of their experience, we were able to do some things that wouldn't have occurred to me would have been possible, right? So they're sort of, if you go, um, I believe that on the page for this event, we've added a link to the, um, to the application itself. But if you go there, there's sort of a, just a landing page that you can click to certain buttons and say, I want to know more about testing or I want to know more about a symptoms or school or whatever. But there's also the capacity to ask the system questions. And so, because we, we felt that we wanted to give people different ways of interacting with it, like say, you know, saying, you know, I'm, I'm feeling a little bit off. What are the symptoms again? You can go directly into it, or you could say, you know, somebody mentioned something to me. Let me kind of ask, try to ask the system a question. We're still refining it. Like obviously, this natural language processing part is actually quite complex, but being able to offer that um, to people has been, uh, we, we think, is actually really a nice feature. And that would have been, would not have been possible with, honestly, none of it would have been possible without the Whiting team. I'm just going to put my own limitations out there. Um, so I was actually really happy to be able to partner with an, another division in the school um, in the university, because I think that that's the, kind, well, I mean, that's the kind of work that the Alliance is trying to support and fund to make sure that we're doing interdisciplinary work. So. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Really gratifying to hear. Um, you know, you can, you know, it's quite obvious how the work you're both doing is going to be incredibly valuable to the communities that you're studying uh, and working with. I'd like to ask a bit about how you see uh, the work you're doing influencing communities outside of those that you're working with. And, and maybe one way of doing that is to maybe ask you to ask each other, have you ask each other questions about what would you like to know about the other person's work? So <laughs> just to throw it, just to throw you off guard a bit, but uh, Daniela, maybe you could try, like, what would you like to know from, you know, the, the work that Dorella is doing that you think would be uh, potentially of, of interest or of? I would really like to know about, um, the strategies that people suggest to overcome mistrust and that kind of historical mistrust. Um, because I think, you know, we have the, we, we wouldn't be effective without Centro Sol, but that's not necessarily a realistic partnership to expect in every community to already be in place. In fact, just sort of as a side note, we've tried to reach out to an equivalent community that's working with other immigrants in the city, like the Korean immigrants, which is the second largest group. And we've struggled to find 
who that natural partner would be. And so what are some of those strategies that you could do um, and maybe adapt and think about to, to, um, to address mistrust and misinformation um, or, or to build trust so that you can, um, so that, so that you can sort of try to try to streamline that process. That would be something that I think would be really helpful writ large. Yeah. I don't know if you have so any I answers yet. <laughs> <laughs> no answers yet, but am I excited to sort of share them and dig in? Absolutely. I think, um, you know, from, from my perspective there, um, I imagine it's going to be um, one of the things that I've learned um, so far, and, and this isn't necessarily just new for this project, uh, is the the need, um, the increasing need for greater, greater attention to interdisciplinary nature of our work. And so from, from my perspective, um, I'm pulling from areas of communication, I'm pulling from areas of um, sociology, anthropology to really try to understand what's going on here. And so when I begin to think about the issue of trust, I'm leaning into my very social scientist background in terms of like, what are those metrics and sort of what is those things and those um, influencers that build trust? Um, and, you know, I, I know, you know, just from my work in organizational capacity building and that sort of thing, what those begin to look like, but I'm excited to hear uh, more about that. And Danielle, of course, you'll be the first person to know once I know. So I'm, <laughs> so I'm really, really excited to continue to do that. Um, and I guess um, a part of the things that I, I would love to, um, uh, to know about your um, project and the work that you're doing is, um, I love the scope, right? In terms of particularly understanding these levels, particularly the federal level and how they begin to impact um, uh, community sort of behavior. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I would love to know more about like how these larger systems, which seemed, and I think is a, a part of the challenge that uh, are out there and just kind of like amorphous, but yet have very specific ways in which they impact Decision making, health decision making, and so um, because for me, when I think about your study, like it is, it is both the immediate, the local, but then there's these larger implications once you take it up that you bump it to that federal level. Yeah, so it's interesting that you bring that point up in particular because there has been some research emerging over the last few years about what is known as the chilling effect mm -hmm. around this political rhetoric and how it has it's, it's already showing demonstrating adverse health outcomes around immigrant communities. It's been primarily studied among the Latinx um, immigrants, but seeing things like avoidance of prenatal care or babies that are born low birth weight, folks that are avoiding um, other preventive or, or delaying curative care, and so this is the kind of thing that, and it's not the kind of thing that's easy necessarily to study, but also to get funding to study because it's basically trying to tell the government about themselves. The other thing that's a little bit that we've talked about um, that would be interesting, but haven't been able to kind of um, figure out exactly a way to do it is um, the way in which state policy mediates that effect, mm. right? So Maryland has for a number of different policies, relatively protective policies for immigrants. In Baltimore City in particular, you know, when this language was being used was, you know, referred to themselves like, behave as a sanctuary city, right? So they don't, they don't cooperate with ICE for raids and stuff like that. That actually, that, that must have implications for how people not only view the city, but view city officials and things like that. The city itself has done a number of trainings with folks in the South, uh, with police officers in the Southeast district to try to bring more language resources there. That does not mean necessarily that there's trust between the community and the police, but at least there is an effort. Um, but if you compare that with states nearby, I mean, even in Pennsylvania, if you think of sort of ID laws and ID laws in Pennsylvania have historically been more restrictive. And so that means that then your ability to even get into a building showing photo ID gets more difficult. Your ability to access care gets more difficult. Um, you know, things like Medicaid expansion and, and all that kind of stuff. So this is only one small piece of that. And, and I'm really glad that we're able to kind of start to look into it. There's, as a matter of fact, this is like hot off the presses, um, a different interdisciplinary team um, led by Sarah Polk in the School of Medicine, we just got a discovery award to look at changes in SNAP enrollment because of the public mm -hmm. charge. Um, because there's a lot of suspicion um, of those of us working in these spaces that folks are not signing up because they're afraid, that even though their kids are eligible, they're afraid that they, it jeopardizes their path to, to residency and, um, and potentially to citizenship. And so that means that kids and families are going hungry when they shouldn't be um, because, because of this animus um, sort of in general that they're, that they're living with and, and a very real fear, obviously, and especially given the kind of things that this particular administration this has been doing um, in terms of uh, what happens to families if they get um, caught at the border. Yeah. Thanks. That's that's uh, 
Very impressive. Can can you tell us a bit? I mean, you've already, so, so first of all, congratulations on the Discovery Award as well, Danielle. Thanks. Um, but um, it sounds like you're both building up a whole pipeline of work. Can you tell us what happens after this study is done? You know, now you're both developing tools that will be used mm-hmm. by people in the community you're working with, but uh, what, what happens when you're done with this? Where, where is this going to? Uh, so Darrell, why don't you go first? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so I think um, one, again, I, I appreciate how Danielle across those fingers. Yes, we want pathway, we want additional funding to continue to expand this, uh, this work. Um, but I think uh, one of the um, partners um, that I did some uh, early HIV training with is the Black AIDS Institute, um, which is a, a black think tank really focused on addressing the need um, for HIV. Um, and they do a lot of work around vaccine um, trials and trying to get African-Americans literacy up. So for me, this work just sits in this broader context where um, they have networks across this country uh, and chapters, local chapters. And then um, how do we begin to leverage those to sort of incorporate this continued sort of literacy development in our own communities um, and especially in communities with high concentrations of African-Americans. And so, some of the lessons that I think we can take from this is around, the, ideally, um, this toolkit, the, hopefully the literacy toolkit will be easy, digestible, and, and quick, and so people can really grasp onto it. Um, and so to then think about sort of what does an evaluation of that look like? So developing some additional partnerships to, to test the, the efficacy of that particular um, item in terms of, does it really help people um, make decisions or, or should we be looking at other levers um, mm-hmm. to, to be able to do that? So I think that's one um, area which I would look, love to continue to explore. Um, but beyond that, I also think that um, the pathway into building stronger community-based partners and collabor- uh, collaborators um, is something that I really want to spend more time in. So my, I feel like my work is going to be more community-based participatory. And so how do I bring folks in at early and earlier parts of the research process to make sure that when we do have a final product, it is actually already, it's it's not already pre-baked, that it's actually sort of been mixed and, and sort of formed and uh, shaped um, for that particular community need. Uh, and then uh, if we can sort of figure out that process and figure out like, what does that look like in terms of replicating it in other places, not necessarily the same work, but the same tools or processes that might be useful in elevating um, um, black voice, um, black experience, uh, particularly around um, building trust. Um, and uh, and honestly, I think uh, to my my knowledge, I have not seen a article yet that says how to actually interrupt mistrust, like how to build trust. I see mistrust. And so my work will hopefully be in different pockets across the country, thinking about the host, the social con- and the context that they're working in, but really trying to, because sp- a part of it is, as Danielle mentioned earlier, talking back to the system. And so in many ways, um, are we really prepared to hear what people say in terms of what they need to be, and to, to, be, to trust an entity or trust a particular knowledge base? Um, and I think from my, my work around misinformation, it says uh, a part of this discourse has always been around the elites um, versus um, the poor, right? And so that's a, that's a whole nother dynamic that um, we might need to interrogate. So I, I think um, drawing on these different approaches, these different um, in, interdisciplinary um, teams and ways of knowing and understanding um, and, and building relationships, I think ultimately Um, it will yield some um, work both from my mind in organizational capacity, um, institutional building and strengthening in in terms of trust, but then also um, within community infrastructure um, to build these hubs to be able to do more literacy, um, scientific literacy work um, in communities that's digestible and fun because it has to be fun. (laughs) (laughs) Excellent. (laughs) It's very daunting, but if it is, I know. (laughs) So can I ask the same question to you, Daniela, but what happens after mm-hmm. the study and where do you see this going? <clears throat> so in the more immediate, the sort of the more immediate short term, we're now working on disseminating the application and, um, you know, iterating, making sure that it's as good as it can be. We have designed it with the idea of, um, so we've ident- designed it with, with a couple of different sort of, I don't want to call them principles because that sounds very high-minded and lofty, but um, with a, a few sort of um, ideas in mind. One is that this should be, the, the platform, the sort of the design of it 
should be usable by, we should be able to take the same thing and then recreate it for say Korean speakers in Baltimore city, right? It's just about making sure that the resources are updated. You get folks that speak Korean that can update the actual look, the actual sort of wording on the page. That's one thing. The second thing is that you should be able, you can, you should also be able to take the Spanish version to a different um, uh, jurisdiction, again, update the resources, um, but the platform is ready. It's ready to go, right? So there's some information that will stay the same, right? Like what are the symptoms, you know, those kinds of things, you know, maybe you're still going to link to a CDC page or to a, a Pan American Health Organization page or whatever, but the, the local stuff would have to change. So the idea is that it should be portable and um, replicable because there's no reason why somebody else should have to reinvent the wheel and whether it is, you know, sort of a municipal effort versus an NGO effort of saying, you know, we've been trying to do this work. And if somebody could just build this for us, we could, you know, repopulate it to us, to our mind, that would be excellent. And we would love to see, um, we would love to see the city take this on um, and, and to, to help institutionalize it. You know, we're also looking for, um, we're also in order to automate the back end more, we're trying to find additional funding resources to be able to do that so that we could hand over sort of a more complete product that then another entity could take forward. Um, and, you know, theoretically could be used for other, other, um, other diseases and conditions and things like that. And the sort of more medium ish term is that I think one of the, one of the things that's been really helpful about this study and about the work that we have been doing is that it has highlighted some really serious systems, health systems gaps for reaching this community which again, we kind of knew about, but um, I think uh, there had been an earlier question about sort of how does this help with sort of vaccination, COVID vaccination and things like that. Right now, the city health department in Baltimore is has a whole campaign about trying to improve vaccination, flu vaccination rates across the city, right? Historically in the city, we have very low vaccination rates. So really trying to reach a lot of different communities. One of the communities they're trying to reach in this flu season is Latinx um, folks in 21224 zip code. And I'm part of the community engagement task force with them. And, and part of what, and so one of the things we're sort of talking about is, okay, in the city, people typically get vaccinated in a private pharmacy like a CVS, right? So, okay, so my folks aren't going to a private pharmacy at CVS because they don't have health insurance or they're not going, you know, they don't have these things to be able to, to access it. So, you know, um, so the city has come up with lots of different strategies, um, flu, um, uh, flu uh, clinics, uh, a mobile van vouchers now are available. So if you text a particular number, they'll send you a voucher and you can take that somewhere. They've created materials that are available in multiple languages with pictures of people from our communities. Um, and I highly recommend checking out the Baltimore City Health Department's like social media, um, especially around the stuff around flu, it's really good. This is all a trial run for COVID. So if we can't figure out the ways to reach these folks now to get the, you know, the elderly African American man and the young Latina mother and the person who works at a, you know, at a grocery store to get their flu vaccine, we're going to have a hard time getting them to get their COVID vaccine. And with the, with the Latino population, it really is about trying to cement the trust between the health department and the community. This is a resource. This isn't just because the other thing to sort of understand more historically, the number of services that are freely available to residents, if you don't have some sort of um, formal resident status, a formal like federal residency status, are pretty limited, right? So women can get prenatal care. Um, once their babies are born, their babies get care. Um, but you don't necessarily get a lot of services from the health department more generally. Um, and so if this is going to be a new thing, you know, if this the city health department really wants to have that kind of penetration, they have to do the work now so that they can make those um, inroads so that they can make those achievements later. So to me, this is raising a lot of sort of systemic systems issues. Um, and I believe um, I had shared for our viewers a link that's at the bottom of the, of, of the page also, which is about a recent article in the Baltimore Sun at the end of last month about the impact of COVID in the Latinx community and, and talking about all of these different things and how, you know, in, you know, things like how many folks are, are getting sick and dying, but also things like, you know, where do they get, how do you, you have to find a funeral home that speaks Spanish to be able to, you know, take care of the, of, of the deceased and things like that. So anyway, um, I recommend that piece also if you have not looked at it. So immediate next steps, dissemination, trying to get people to use it, um, convince them that it's a good thing. And then, um, and then after that, uh, think about how what we were learning helps us improve for the future. So that's that's awesome <clears throat> and and very clear. Uh, let me take a few more questions from the audience, and and one of them actually is about a question of sustainability or what happens. And this is from Lois, who says we've been hearing a strong sentiment from the community that you're only bringing me this because it's a funded project. Um, mm -hmm. 
what are the things that we can do to make the kind, I, th I think we may have heard some of this already, but just to tell us a little bit more about what are the kinds of things we can do to make these activities more sustainable? Darrell, did you like to go first? Or? Yeah, so I, I think, um, so one of the things I know about building partnerships is that uh, you, it's really hard to do when you're just coming in with an ask when it doesn't really benefit the other person in, in, the, in, the, in the party. And so I think um, Hopkins has some really great um, community engagement process. I know we had a really great response with the COVID-19, making sure that families had food, um, that we had all of these additional resources. So I think that is actually a great um, way to, content, to, to do the, thing, the work of the community um, when it's not necessarily specific to the community. So I know that was res that response was in response to COVID-19, um, but how are we ensuring that throughout our work, we're still addressing issues of food insecurity, um, thinking about our role um, so that when, when people come, when you ask them, they have, you have already built up enough credibility and trust um, so that um, it makes them more likely to wanna participate. And so I think Baltimore, as we know, have some deep seated structural inequalities around um, poverty um, and health access and care. Um, and so, you know, um, food insecurity is also, uh, you know, huge, especially now. And so I think um, when we're building and think about sustainability, um, that it, ha it has to go beyond our research project. And so a way that in my mind that you do that is by helping people meet their basic needs um, and then providing additional resources where you can. Um, and, you know, in the absence of those things, it gets really hard and it always feels transactional. Um, at the end of the day. And I think at the end of the day, we do not want to have a transactional relationship with the community of Baltimore City, the black community in Baltimore City, um, the poor folks and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like it has to be intentional, reciprocal mm -hmm. and let them know that they actually bring something um, besides just their little bod their bodies to, to the table, right? Um, for mm -hmm. our examination or investigation, but, um, but they're actually, they matter because they're a part of the community. And I think, if Hopkins continues to build out its uh, social supports and protective um, programs, um, that those shouldn't be seen as just like small ancillary things. They, they are primary. And I think um, uh, that they are all about building goodwill and good connection um, to the people who need it the most. And that's multi-purpose. It's not COVID yeah. specific. You know, mm -hmm. So Danielle, there's a specific question for you from Casey who asks, are you aware of any organizations with a mission to provide culturally relevant health information and resources to migrant populations? So there are in different parts of the country, some organizations that do some of this work. I don't, I'm not familiar with any national level organizations. Um, and then there are certainly a number of advocacy organizations that will in particular focus on sort of things like, you know, what are your rights? Um, the state has a Le Latino legislative caucus, uh, which I think, um, does make an effort to um, to be able to inform folks of their rights. I am honestly not clear about their level of penetration um, with uh, within different communities. I mean, I think that for those, you know, the any one representative is closely connected to their elected, you know, to sort of their catchment area. But beyond that, it, it's not clear to me. But that seems to me like, in particular, in Maryland, would be a, a potentially good avenue for, for sharing those kinds of, um, that kind of information. Otherwise it ends up falling, I think, on individual organizations. And that being said, I, I, there's one, I'm sorry, the one big omission on my part. Casa de Maryland has been doing lots and lots and lots of work around um, educating folks about their rights, advocating in the state assembly, um, providing uh, job opportunities, lots of different things. Um, so Casa de Maryland has been doing a lot of work and they're not, they have their, they have big offices, big presence here in Baltimore City, but they also have presences in, in other places in Maryland as well. Okay. Now there's another question from Sonia asking if there's any conspiracy issues that you've come across that you've been able to debunk in your work. Uh, either of you. So this is a two-part challenge. It's not only to hear conspiracy theories, but you've been able to, uh, well, I'm, I'm maybe adding the effectively debunk is, is a tough one. But um, uh, Darrell? Uh, so no. So uh, yes, I've heard um, conspiracies. And I think those are, I think um, when we begin to uh, look deeper into those um, conspiracy theories, um, I, I think it's a growing body of research. And I think we need to pay close attention to it, partly because um, what folks have been able to do in that space is to present something um, that is partially true and then spin it um, so that becomes um, a, a, 
it, so that the spin isn't necessarily that outlandish um, because mm -hmm. they start with something that is partially true and then expand on it to, to embellish and make all of the things that we need. Um, so again, the, the, pan, um, the, uh, the, pan, the pandemic, um, which was a huge um, uh, YouTube viral sensation, a, a video with, with a discredited researcher um, talking about um, the, 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 uh, all of these, um, whether it's the government's role in your lives and, um, and then you should never get a vaccine. So like um, that had to be de debunked and it was debunked by you know, um, paid people because it, the, 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 the rate of misinformation and conspiracy theories that are emerging it's astronomical. And I think that's why the WHO, um, the World Health Organization, um, talked about this as an infodemic. And it's, it, it's because it's so much misinformation and disinformation circulating. And at the end of the day, I think people really want something to grab onto to really try to work themselves through sort of um, this very difficult time. They want something, they want a solution. I think if nothing else, they, wanna, they want something to grab onto. Um, and, and unfortunately, um, if we're not combating that information, if we don't have the trust, if we don't have all of these institutional practices that um, begin to shed light on how committed we are to um, high quality care, it gets really, really challenging. Um, and so I know folks debunk information, but I have not yet had the opportunity to do that. But I, you know, that, that might be something, even when I'm listening and asking folks their qualitative interviews, what will come up for them? And we might be able to, to debunk some other things moving forward in the future. Mm. Danielle, do you want to try this question? So, so not, I mean, nothing has come up explicitly in our work um, as a specific sort of myth or misinformation. I will say that early on in the, um, in the pandemic, before we had even had the study, before the city was even in lockdown, um, we, I was invited to do, there were, there's a group known, uh, called Comité Latino, which is an organization, another, um, uh, non-governmental organization here in the city. They have monthly meetings where they get together and they do different things and they have various speakers. And so they invited me to come and just talk about COVID and stuff. And so I brought sort of the early information of wash your hands and, you know, don't touch your face and like all this kind of stuff. Um, and there some things came up and we were very clear about like, you know, don't, you know, things, you know, sort of do's and don'ts, you know, you don't have to hoard food, you know, you don't have to hoard water. That's not gonna, I mean, it was like, this is not a hurricane, like you're gonna still be able to go to the supermarket. Um, so, um, but, uh, you know, I, I look back on that experience and I was, I was giving the best available advice that I had at the time. And there's been a big shift even in the kind of um, information and recommendations and um, advice that we give people even from February until now. And so I think that what's made a huge difference um, is when, when sort of more established institutions can tap into those channels that people trust and give repeated information and talk about like things are changing, things are evolving. You know, this is not, we're not going back against everything we've said, we're just learning more about this and bringing a, a sort of more hum, uh, a more humble approach to this rather than sort of science as the answer because that's where you, I think you end up running into some problems sometimes because then people feel like, well, I don't, how can I believe you now? I believed you the last time and it turns out this stuff isn't true now. So I, that would be sort of my personal experience with it. Great. So we've, we've got only a, a few minutes left and I wanted to ask one question to each of you that is also being echoed in the, in the questions. And, and that's the question of like, what happens next? Uh, partly it's about what happens to your work once COVID hopefully dies down, but also, you know, where do you, where do you want to take your work once, once, uh, once this study is done? So Darrell, why don't you go take that one first? I think um, the issue of trust will remain um, and it has prior to COVID-19 um, and after, um, and particularly around ensuring that um, African-Americans, specifically low-income African-Americans have access to high quality care. And because my work intersects in a number of different areas, particularly around HIV, um, uh, again, like uh, the issues of trials become um, particularly challenging and making sure that we have enough representation from diverse communities participating in them. And so I think a part of that issue is also the trust, right? And so if we want more people to participate in our scientific endeavors to, to bring about this larger structural um, uh, ways to address disease, um, we have to figure out how to do that so that we can, at least when we need to do a trial, can get those numbers. And so I think whether I'm talking about um, vaccine trials around HIV, um, um, or clinical trials, or I'm um, trying to figure out ways to get um, uh, sort of LGBT folks to trust their institutions in order to get the highest quality of care um, in those spaces. I, I think my work and particularly around the trust building um, and the naming of what does it really mean for different communities 
um, will hopefully uh, just allow systems to get better and better and better. Um, and so um, I think that's my hope. And um, every lesson I learn from this will um, be short. I, I, I see it helping me do everything else that I want to do in terms of this interdisciplinary work. Thanks. And, and Daniela, what's next? So, I mean, I would say that, you know, sure, COVID may die down some, but I think that the, the underlying problems, as Darrell is saying, the underlying issues aren't going away. We're just moving away from a slightly sort of acute crisis point to a more sort of persistent set of issues. Um, and, you know, I mentioned some of the other studies that I'm involved with. I, I think that this trying to understand the effect of policies on people's health um, is something that is emerging more and more as an area of research that I think could be is really, really interesting and really, really powerful. Um, the same way that we sort of there's been more involving research around sort of historical trauma and things like that, that, that we need to understand better. Um, and then we need to adjust our systems. And then I think the, the, the real, the big sh shift ends up being in how do you adapt systems that are meant to work or that are designed to work for sort of like the broadest um, section of the population, you know, the people who have ability, you know, who, who have, you know, all, all their sort of abilities intact and who have a decent amount of money and have insurance and things like that to actually work for everybody else that is somehow excluded from the system. And my personal viewpoint, the, the sort of the soapbox that I get on is that you should start, you should actually be designing the system to work for the people who are, who have the least amount of access, because then by definition, everyone else will do better. Um, but if instead you sort of start from, you know, who is it easiest for us to reach, then you're retrofitting back to people who have a lot of needs and, it, and it's just so much harder and you get so much resistance. Oh, thank you. It's been really delightful, I'd say inspiring to, to talk with both of you, Darrell and Daniela. It's, it's really important and compelling work that you're doing and really moving us from mistrust and misinformation to trust and information. I think we've learned a lot from you about uh, building relationships, capacity, collaborations, and how that's so important in trust and information and working particularly in communities that have multiple and intersecting vulnerabilities that affect their health. It really is uh, a challenge and uh, a challenge that you're clearly taking up. So it's, it's been really great to hear about you. So with that, I'd like to say thank you for your time. Thank you to those at home who've uh, joined us and uh, goodbye for now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.